Yes, last time I talked a, a bit about, well, it's sort of a broad overview of some of the type 1A models and observations. Um, and uh, I didn't fortunately get to talk so much about the mergers. I figure I'll put that off uh, to one of the later talks. We might come back to it maybe when we're talking about neutron star mergers, uh, at least to draw some connection there. But here I wanted to sort of uh, do a more uh, detailed dive instead of an overview into um, uh, into the supernova. Let's see if I can get this on again. Uh, no. Somehow we switched to HDMI. Maybe you can get me to back on VGA. Um, about supernova spectra. So I showed you, you know, several supernova. There, there was up for a second. Uh, I showed you supernova spectra and showed you some uh, comparison to radiation transport models and so on. Uh, and I said this basic factor that you notice, you know, to first order these spectra are, are kind of, you know, quasi black bodies with these broad absorption features. Broad because of the high velocities in the supernova ejecta. Uh, and I marked here some of the. Uh, you know, identifications of the lines uh, in the type 1A spectra. And so a lot of what you do in astrophysics, whether you're an observer or theorist, is look at spectra like this and try to do some analysis of it, try to identify what features are there, try to tell what that means about, say, the composition or the kinematics of what's going on in the, in the supernova. And the type 1As are, are, are fairly well understood, but other supernova you may come across or other transients, uh, the analysis is. Uh, not so straightforward. And so what I thought I'd do is, you know, in the spirit of how Udi yesterday gave you some kind of physical intuition into how light curves of supernova work, uh, I'll give you some insight into how the spectra work, and that will lead also into some more detailed discussions of how radiation transport and, and the light curves work, hopefully with some practical application in terms of showing you uh, some, some tools I can make available for you to help uh, identify which lines are important and, and how to uh, uh, interpret what uh, their kinematics are, uh, and maybe also some guidance on how you can write your own little code to calculate supernova spectra and, and understand uh, how these profiles form. Because uh, it's, it's, it's actually not uh, so difficult. And some of the radiation transfer physics will be you know, critically important to understanding uh, opacities and light curves of things like type 1a supernova and, and eventually kilonova where the line features and the line absorptions are actually crucial in setting the opacity and setting the light curve behavior and colors, okay? So, so let me go on with that, and, and of course you can uh, interrupt me as, you, uh, uh, as I go along. Uh, you probably have some sense of, of how these uh, general features in supernova spectra look like. You, you may be familiar with this kind of picture of a P-Signy profile which is we have a supernova and we're going to talk first about supernova in the photospheric phase where they're optically thick. So there's some photosphere where you're optically thick in the continuum and that's sort of your emission light bulb in the center. And then there's some lower density material around there where you might be optically thin in the continuum but you may be optically thick in lines. And so line formation is happening outside of that region. And then the general picture of what the spectrum is looking like as you may know, if the observer is looking this way, well, material here in front of the photosphere is moving towards the observer, and it's blocking the photosphere light, so you uh, get generally a blue shifted absorption. Material moving sort of tangentially or, or away from the observer is not blocking the photosphere, and you're just emitting line emission, and you get this uh, uh, red shifted emission. Okay? So that's the classic P-Signy profile, and that's a good way to understand what's going on. But we can get a more detailed picture of what the radiation transport is in these moving atmospheres uh, and, and get some uh, uh, better sense of, of, of what's going on. Okay, so that's what I'll go through. Uh, and it'll be sort of a, I don't know, what you might call an elementary supernova model or an elementary spectrum model. Uh, and we'll make several assumptions uh, to try to understand what's going on. And so we'll start with a picture kind of like that. 
uh, where we have here, you know, some photosphere as corresponding to the tau equals one surface roughly in the continuum, right? And then the density of the ejecta is usually decreasing uh, with radius, so you'll have some region around it. I can draw a sphere um, where it's optically thin in the continuum, but uh, maybe optically thick in some lines. So this is what you might call the line forming region. And so this is our basic picture, basically uh, a light bulb shining into the fog around it, okay? And we'll make several approximations to try to understand what's going on. And what's crucially uh, important and, and fascinating about this is that we're going to think about you know, photons and, and radiation transporting in, a, in an atmosphere where everything is expanding. And that changes the, the whole picture of what's going on. So, so let's make some assumptions to try to make this um, tractable and try to understand basically the physics of what's going on uh, in the supernova spectra. All right. Uh, the first one will be that we'll assume basically that the source of our continuum emission is coming from this basically, you know, a sharp black body photosphere. Okay. So basically, this, this kind of surface is uh, emitting some intensity, um, some photospheric intensity, intensity that's, uh, you know, let's say just the black body function at some temperature, you know, the photospheric temperature, right? And if you care to know what that photospheric temperature is, well, as an estimate, you may say, well, I, I can use, you know, Stefan's law if I have a luminosity, then luminosity is related to the temperature just by 4 pi r squared t photosphere to the fourth. So in this kind of picture, we're, we're going to assume that the luminosity is given to us. So let's say we did one of Udi's models that he described for a light curve, and it said at peak the luminosity is this. And now we want to know what the spectrum is going to look like. All right, so we'll get some luminosity. Maybe you're given a photosphere, or maybe you calculate it, given some um, density profile you think is appropriate for your ejecta, right? Now, this is a pretty poor approximation. Why is this a poor approximation? Do you have a question? Or? Yeah. Yeah, good, good question. So the photosphere we're defining is where the continuum opacity is roughly 1. So this is sort of where the radiation decouples um, uh, from the gas. So it, you know, inside here, radiation is getting absorbed across all wavelengths and coming out as a black body. Uh, there, there is an interior layer where the you know, tau is C over V, which Udi was talking about as a, as a diffusion radius. And that's sort of the radius at which the, the, the light can diffuse out faster than the whole well, supernova is expanding. So basically, the luminosity is coming from this uh, inner diffusion radius. It's moving out. It's still getting absorbed and re-emitted. And then it's decoupling at the photosphere. And so the temperature of the continuum is being set at the photosphere. Okay. For our purposes here, we're going to sort of blank out everything you know, interior to the photosphere and just take that as sort of a boundary condition. Okay. But why is, this a, why is this a poor approximation in some sense to assume that this is sort of a sharp sphere emitting as a black body? Any thoughts on that? Is it really a, a, a one sharp defined surface where the continuum is being generated? No, I mean, obviously, there's going to be some gradient in density. There's going to be some transition from some optically thick region to some optically thin region. So the photosphere is some sort of uh, 
smooth, kind of nebulous thing, some width to it in a sense. And so we're approximating that as sort of a, a single surface. Um, also, the, the photosphere uh, radius is, is in general going to be wavelength uh, dependent. I mean, if we look at the opacity, say, uh, it's a function of wavelength at some point, you know, in this atmosphere. Uh, uh, what's it look like? Well, there's going to be some, you know, continuum opacity here, and then there'll be some regions where there's some strong line where the opacity jumps in some narrow region. Maybe there's another line here, you know, other lines, so on and so forth. So the opacity might look something like that. We can discuss what's setting the continuum opacity, which is basically setting where this photosphere here is. So, so the general processes would be, you know, electron scattering is a good one. That's a continuum opacity that's roughly independent of wavelength. But you can also have, uh, you know, bound free opacity, photoionization opacity, or, or free free opacity, which are, have some wavelength dependence to it. And actually, what we'll see in, in type 1a supernova, as well as kilonova and other things, the, the actual continuum uh, is itself dominated by lines, actually. It's a it's blend of sort of a forest of lines. So actually, if I were to draw this right, it might kind of look more like this. There's sort of a forest of lines. And out of that forest, you know, maybe there's a few strong lines that peek out. Okay. But basically, in general, the, you know, the continuum opacity here is, is not going to be independent of wavelength. So the photosphere actually, what you define as the photosphere, the tau of one surface, is actually depends upon what wavelength you're, you're looking at. Right? You look longer wavelengths, you might see a little deeper into the ejecta. So true radiation transport calculation would capture that physics. Um, here, we're making this simplified assumption that Basically, we have one photosphere that emits a black body across all wavelengths, okay? It's a coarse approximation, but it, it works for our purposes, all right? So that's our assumption that we'll have some continuum emitting into this fog, and we'll want to understand how lines form above it and how we can figure out which are the strong lines and, and what they're spectral profiles will look like. We make some more assumptions. So let's make a second assumption uh, that we're basically, for the purposes of this spectrum calculation, we're going to ignore any time dependence. All right. And this might be called the stationarity assumption. All right, and I'll, I'll use the terminology stationarity instead of static because we're still going to want to take into account the fact that this ejecta is expanding. There's some velocity gradient that's actually crucial for making these broad spectral features. But we're basically going to assume that if I, you know, if I have a photon emitted from the photosphere and it starts traveling through, that it's going to escape the ejecta. Let's say the ejecta has some radius, you know, r max. That it'll be able to escape the ejecta on a time scale that's short uh, compared to the time scale at which this ejecta is expanding. Right? So that over the time scale of the photons diffusing out, we can take the density and the temperature and, and all the uh, conditions in the ejecta to be fixed. We don't have to worry about any time dependence, and that's. That's a reasonable approximation, right? Because uh, you know, if you if you take the time scale for a photon to sort of free stream out of our uh, ejecta, it's basically going to just be you know light crossing time r max over c, whereas the time scale for the ejecta to expand is going to be basically r max over the velocity of expansion, sort of v max, right? 
Excuse me? Yeah, so, so yeah, good question. Let me, uh, so here I'm assuming that the photons are basically just free streaming out of the photosphere. Now if I had a photon, and so again goes back to what Udi was saying, if I have a photon emitted sort of deep within the photosphere where the optical depth is higher than one, you know, it's going to take some random walk and diffuse out and take much longer to escape. And so this time scale for escape becomes larger by a factor of tau, the diffusion time. And so the, the diffusion here is, is, uh, can be long. But if we're just talking about photons coming from our inner boundary condition and going out, you know, here the optical depth is, is one or less. And so they basically can just free stream out. Okay? That's the assumption that we're basically blocking off all the diffusion going on in the interior and just taking some boundary condition. Yeah? What's that? Mm. Yeah, so R max would be sort of the outer edge of the ejecta. So that's a good point. This is not really a well-defined surface as well. The density of the, uh, of the ejecta with the radius is probably you know, falling off in some way like this. And so there'll be some region here, the photosphere. Uh, and then this will be the region where the lines form. Uh, but there'll be some region out here where basically the densities are so low, we don't care about the ejecta. Either the ejecta basically cuts off, or the densities are so low that you don't have any significant line opacity as well. And so that will depend upon the model. So here again, we're just kind of taking that as a sharp surface, but really it's a, it's a gradual fall off. Okay. But basically here you see, I mean, this is kind of trivial, the, the, the free streaming time of photons coming out is much less than the time scale for expansion as long as uh, sort of the velocity of expansion is much, much less than C, right? You know, basically the photons are moving out at C, the ejecta is moving out at V. As long as we're sort of, you know, not close to relativistic, the photons are going to get out much faster than the ejecta changes its properties. And so this assumption of stationarity should be a, should be a reasonable one, okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I should really define it as, as from the center of the star. So I'll define R max from the center and R fot from the center as well. Yeah. Yeah, or you might say if it's emitted from the photosphere, it's maybe R max minus R fot over C. It's traveling, you know, from here say, to the, does that make sense? To the outer regions, right? <coughs> Just saying the photons emitted from our boundary here can escape the ejecta much faster than the ejecta itself can expand, since the photons are moving much faster. Good. Other questions? Um, OK. And then the third thing we're going to try to assume is what we want to know is, is you know, what lines are going to be important in the spectrum. How do we estimate which ones are the optically thick lines uh, and which ones are unimportant? And so make a third assumption here that, the, uh, that we only have opacity, say, from a single line. So we'll only worry about a single line at, at a time and see how the spectrum forms from that. Now we'll be able to easily generalize this uh, afterwards uh, to the case where we have multiple lines and maybe the lines blend together and so on to form the full spectrum. 
Okay. But let's start with this. And so what does opacity from a, from a single line look like? I drew it before. Here's the function of wavelength here. I'll just plot the cross section of a line, right? And so we'll assume that basically there's, there's no continuum opacity outside the photosphere. So all we have is line opacity out here. And then we'll have some line feature like that, right? And the key features for defining this line is, well, there's going to be a sort of rest center wavelength, right? So this will depend upon the, the line you care about. If you're talking about H alpha or something, you have 65, 63, and so on. There's a, there's a width to this line, an intrinsic width to it, a delta lambda. And what, what sets the, uh, what sets the uh, intrinsic width of, of a line, of any given line? What's that? Velocity, yeah, which velocity? Thermal velocity. Thermal velocity, yeah. So, I mean, we're going to have to take into account the, the global velocity of expansion that, that actually sets the, the total width of the line. But if we're just thinking about, you know, locally some piece of gas, what sets the width of the line? Well, usually we'll have some sort of thermal broadening. There's, of course, some, you know, quantum mechanical broadening as well. Uh, but that's usually small compared to the thermal broadening. So usually in most cases of astrophysics, we have some thermally broadened line where the width of the line is just set by the fact that the gas is hot. It's, there's part, you know, the atoms are moving around in some random way due to their thermal motions, and that gives you some Doppler shift um, that gives you some width to the line, just given by a Doppler shift formula. All right, so the width would be the rest wavelength times whatever this thermal velocity is over C. Okay. Uh, where the thermal velocity is just the standard expression for thermal velocity. So it's 2 kT over m. m is the mass of the atom you care about. Maybe we're talking about hydrogen here, so just the mass of a hydrogen atom. So what's the typical thermal velocity of a, some gas in the supernova ejecta, some piece of gas? Any thoughts on that? What's the typical temperature maybe of a you know, <coughs> supernova or a TDE or something like that? What thoughts? What, 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 what wavelengths do, they, do, do supernova radiate, radiate at mostly? <coughs> Optical wavelengths. So what, what temperatures does that correspond to roughly? 5,000, 10,000, something, something in that range. So what does that mean for this velocity? Hundred. You, could, you can calculate it. Yeah, you could plug in this number, look up your Boltzmann constant in mass and, and plug it in. Or you do something clever. I mean, it's always nice to dimensionalize something here. So if I care about Vt over C, I could put, divide both sides by C. This comes as a square inside the square root. Now I see this is a ratio of, of two energies, which we should hopefully know. So what's the, what's the thermal energy, typical thermal energy in a piece of the supernova gas, right? If you're at 5,000, 10,000 Kelvin. EV range, right? Optical photon. So this is about an EV. And then what's MC squared for a typical atom like hydrogen? 
What's that? Mega. Well, I'm talking about the, the, the whole hydrogen atom. This is the motion of the whole hydrogen atom, so the proton. And that's it. G, GeV, GeV for a, for a proton, right? Or some combination of protons, 10 to the 9. Right. So this ratio would be over to you. It would be something like 10 to the minus 4.5. 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 of C is the typical thermal velocity. Yeah, good. So you can multiply that by the speed of light. You get something like a few kilometers a second, 10 kilometers or so, a second or so. So that's much less, right? Thermal velocities, much, much less than the, you know, the ejecta velocities or something, right? Which are sort of like 10,000. And that'll be crucial for actually understanding how radiation is transported in supernova atmospheres uh, and how we can understand opacities, all right? So V over C for the, for the ejecta may be something like a few percent, right? This is much smaller by orders of magnitude. The width of this line is very narrow, right? If this is hydrogen, it's H alpha at 65, 63. The width here is, you know, that times it. So maybe it's some fraction of an angstrom. So these are, these are narrow lines, and the narrow line limit will be, will be crucial for what we do. Okay. Yeah, and we'll we'll come back to that. Yeah. So after I've run a shock or something through there, and I've dumped in energy into my star in the initial explosion, you know, usually I have the real result of a strong shock, sort of you know almost equal energy and kinetic energy and thermal energy, which means that the thermal velocities will be of order the kinetic energy. So this will be much higher. But then, and Udi talked about this as well, after the explosion, the supernova expands uh, and it cools by adiabatic expansion. It does PDV work. And so that internal energy goes into accelerating the ejecta. It turns into kinetic energy. And so by the time we're looking at the supernova spectra, I'll quantify this in a bit, you know, days or weeks or months later, the thermal, it's cooled down to a, you know, a few thousand kilometers per second, but the, uh, sorry, yeah, a few kilometers per second, whereas the uh, ejective velocities remain at tens of thousands of kilometers per second, okay? Uh, there's one more thing that I erased my, erased my line profile. And one more thing we might want to quantify in this, uh, plot here, which is basically, you know, how strong the cross-section is as well. What's sort of the peak of this cross-section. So we'll need that to calculate how strong lines are and actually get some expression for the optical depth of lines that will ultimately tell us, well, which lines are the important ones. And so what's the cross-section of a line? You all remember this from your radiation processes class is a good good thing to know. You may not remember. Anybody? All right. There's some combination of constants here that gives sort of the overall scale of the cross section. There's some oscillator strength here which describes the intrinsic strength of whatever line you're interested in, right? You can drive this all, of course, in quantum mechanics, looking at sort of some transition between two atomic levels. Or even more simply, you can derive it classically by thinking about just a simple harmonic oscillator that has some frequency to it, and you send in some electromagnetic wave, and you drive that harmonic oscillator, see how it responds. You get this combination of constants here. And the oscillator strength basically tells you what the quantum mechanical correction is to the classical thing. So it's some number of order unity that you look up for whatever line you're interested in. I'll, I'll point you to some resources to get you your, your oscillator strength. But you know, for H alpha, something like 0.6 or something, right? 
Uh, then you have something that describes you know, the line profile shape. So for these typical sort of Gaussian profiles that we get from thermal broadening, since the motion of the atoms is a Gaussian, um, this function here basically is just a Gaussian describing that, that distribution. Some function that if I integrate it up uh, over wavelength, it's normalized to 1. So basically it's just telling me about the shape. This is telling me sort of the overall normalization of the cross-section. Right? All right, so this would be uh, a Gaussian in general. For simplicity, we could maybe even take a simpler profile, just sort of a flat top line. That would be even simpler. And as we'll see, the actual shape and width of the line don't even matter since they're so narrow. We'll get rid of that in the end of the day. So for a flat top, this function here is basically just 1 over the width of the, 1 over the width of the line set by this thermal velocity. If I did a real profile of a Gaussian, I'd have an e to the minus lambda minus lambda naught. Let's just, let's just assume it's flat here, has that value in here, and of course, zero anywhere outside of the line. All right? And just saying that if I have a broader line, I spread out the opacity over more wavelength, you know, my overall cross section goes down. But the, Normalized integrated over the whole line stays the same. Okay. Um, there's one more factor here in this case lambda squared over C, the rest wavelength squared over C, um, which just because uh, this just comes in because I've chosen to describe this line profile function in, in, in sort of uh, wavelength dimensions instead of frequency dimensions. So. It's actually a little more common to describe this as a set of a delta lambda, a delta nu, a spread in frequency. And then I wouldn't need this term here, just have this as sort of 1 over delta nu. But since we're working with wavelength, and we usually wave, use wavelength for optical spectra, I'll stick with everything in wavelength units, OK? So, so this is not too hard, and you should know this, because whatever, you, you know, there's lots of times in your life you're going to want to know what the strength of a line is. If, what, you know, if you measure some line, you want to know, well, what does that tell me about how much this element is or not? Uh, and uh, this is general. It's not having anything to do with supernova. It's just for any line. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can plug in numbers if you're interested in what the typical cross-section is, right? So if we plug in our typical, say, delta lambda, which I said for, say, H alpha at 10,000 kilometers per second is some fraction of an angstrom, plug in the oscillator strength, you'll get a cross-section something like 10 to the minus 13 centimeters squared. Okay. Is that a big cross-section? Small cross section, 10 to the minus 13. No, what's a typical cross section? What's a typical electron scattering cross section? What's that? 0.4. Point 0.4 is the opacity. And if you turn that into a cross section by multiplying it by the uh, mass involved, then that's uh, uh, something like 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. This is 10 to the minus 13. So this is much, much bigger. Lines are very strong. Of course, this is just the cross section. If I want to know the optical depth or so on, I'm going to have to multiply this by the number of atoms that are in the lower level of the particular transition I want. So it may be for, say, H alpha, there's only a small fraction of the atoms in the lower level of that transition. And we'll talk about that. That'll be crucial for setting the, the opacity. <coughs> 
This, uh, I've defined this phi here in terms of a wavelength unit, so it's, so it's dimensions of one over wavelength, <laughs> which is why I need this term here. This is a cross section, this is unit centimeters squared. All right. What's that? This, this has units cross section per frequency. And then I multiply this down here. So, okay. That's the total cross section. Okay. So those are good things to know. All right, the, uh, what else do we need to know though? The last thing we want to take into account is the fact that this whole medium is expanding and that's going to be crucial for our understanding of the, how the <coughs> photons act, interact with lines. And so we'll make the common assumption here that this medium is expanding and we'll generalize, of course, or not generalize, but we'll specialize to homologous expansion, which you are probably familiar with by now, that radius is velocity times time, or velocity is radius over time. If I want, I can make these vectors velocity points in the radial direction everywhere. Okay. You've heard this a lot for supernova ejecta already. So of course this term homologous is just kind of referring to sort of the self-similarity of the ejecta over time. So if I have some ejecta structure with say some density profile or something, it's maybe it has some compositional profile. There's nickel inside, silicon on the outside. Homologous expansion means if I look at it at one time, if I look at it some later time, it looks exactly the same in its shape. It's just everything is scaled out. It just gets bigger. Density drops, but uh, the whole structure is basically frozen out, uh, and the whole thing is just getting bigger over time. So later times are homologous with earlier times. Even if this ejecta is aspherical, has some clumps or something, uh, over time that Asymmetrical structure stays frozen and just gets bigger. And we, we need not actually uh, make the assumption of spherical symmetry on the point of view. Okay? Yeah? Uh, this, uh, this is uh, Vmax you were showing earlier? The Vmax? Well, what this is kind of saying is that any point in this ejecta, you know, if I go to any radius here, the velocity here is basically just r over t. So at r max, it's you know whatever the v max over t. Velocity is a function of radius. Is just linear, right? And if I this is at some time we're thinking about again some snapshot in time, maybe at the maximum of the light curve at some later time. Of course, things are homologous, so the density structure looks the same. It just scales out and maybe goes down, but it has the exact same shape. The velocity also is linear, but maybe extends out to larger radii. Okay. So why can we make this uh, homologous expansion assumption that's so crucial to you know just about everything we do? All the light curve analysis also assume homologous expansion. Um, this is getting to what, what Rem was saying, you know, in the explosion itself, of course, the dynamics are complicated. There's pressure forces going on, there's acceleration, there may be some complicated motions. Um, but after some time, you have sort of an explosion and expanding material uh, with some thermal energy or internal energy that's comparable to the kinetic energy. But over time, that expands and that thermal energy drops. And again, that expansion time uh, after the explosion is going to be something like, say, the radius of the star that we exploded over the 
typical velocity that things are expanding at, right? So if I explode a star, this is going to be basically the time scale for it to double in size, right? And if it doubles in size, the energy density in this radiation-dominated plasma is going to drop by a factor of two as well. And if it increases by a factor of 100, that internal de energy density is going to drop by a factor of 100. And so basically, the thermal velocity, which is also essentially the sound speed, is going to become much less than the uh, expansion velocity. So after many of these expansion times, and if I were to plug in numbers here, this would be something like, I think, uh, I think it's like 100 seconds for a solar radius. Uh, and velocity of about 10,000 kilometers a second, or 10 to the 9 centimeters a second. So if I blow up the sun, something of the solar radius, uh, at a velocity of about 10 to the 9 centimeters per second, then after 100 seconds, it's doubled in, in, in size. You know, after about 10 to the 4 seconds, so several hours, it's increased by a factor of 100. Uh, and by that time, essentially, uh, the internal energy is a small fraction of the kinetic energy. And it really can't do any more work accelerating or changing the ejecta structure anymore. There's not any more uh, acceleration uh, possible. Or to put it another way, the sound speed is much less than the expansion speed at that phase, so pressure forces can't really move around to do anything. It's a highly supersonic flow at that point. So, uh, you know, at some multiple of this expansion time, you can pretty much assume you're in homologous expansion. Uh, and, of course, the, the, the results here is basically first-year physics, right? If you have something expanding without any acceleration, well, R is V times T. So that's all that's going on. After some period of time, things are just freely expanding without acceleration. Uh, and basically, the radius is velocity times time. That's really all there is to it. You know, for a white dwarf, they say a type 1a supernova, this radius is small, some fraction of a solar radius. And this, this time scale is maybe about a second, a few seconds. So in that case, after maybe a few minutes, you're in homologous expansion. And so it's, you know, definitely by the time we're observing this at weeks or days later, the assumption is quite good. If you blow up a red giant, the radius is something like, you know, 500 solar radii. This time scale may be hours, and so to reach them all, expansion might take days. And so the assumption may not be quite so good for the first several days, okay? And so you, must, you might have to worry about that. And there's, of course, other things that can break this assumption of homologous expansion. If you somehow later, sometime later in the, you know, say a week later, you dump in a bunch of energy that's comparable to the kinetic energy, maybe you turn on a magnetar or something, dump in a bunch of energy. Well, all of a sudden you've raised the internal energy to something comparable to the kinetic energy, and you're going to have pressure forces working again, and you're going to screw up homologous expansion, or if you, you know, run into some circumstellar material and so on. So those will be special cases. Um, and actually, everything I'll say will be generalizable to other, or most other velocity laws. And so you may be interested in other sorts of events where you have, say, winds going out. Maybe they're constant velocity or accelerating, or maybe you have some tidal disruption event where you have some complicated rotational motion or other things. Uh, the arguments I'll give here will be generalizable, although the, I won't go through them and the mathematics becomes more complicated. Homologous is particularly simple. Uh huh. Yeah, to some extent, but to a small extent. So, for example, type 1a, you know, the kinetic energy is about 10 to the 51 ergs. Uh, you start dumping an energy from nickel decay, cobalt decay, and your typical energy you might get out of that is about 10 to the 50 ergs or something a little smaller. Um, and so that does break homologous expansion sort of at the 10% level, and it's usually ignored in calculations, but Basically, yeah, you dump in energy in the nickel region and you kind of create a high pressure region that blows like a little bubble, kind of lowers the density. 
It's typically ignored, but it's, it's there at some level. But usually radioactive energy is, is a small fraction of the kinetic energy, except maybe in some special cases you might be interested in. Good? So we have homologous expansion, but what's really interesting is just expansion in general, because that's what makes the whole transport of radiation, both spectrum and light curves, go in supernova atmospheres. So again, if I emit a photon, say at the photosphere, at some wavelength and have it move along to some other point, well, in the observer frame, if I'm standing back watching this, you know, the wavelength of the photon's not changing as it goes along. But in the co-moving frame of this ejecta, so if I jump into a frame that's moving along with the ejecta, the, radi uh, the wavelength of the photon is, is Doppler shifting relative to that co-moving frame, right? It's starting out from some place that's moving slowly and moving to some other place that's moving more quickly, right? So in the frame where I look at it, actually the wavelength of the photon is, is getting redshifted. This is basically equivalent to the Hubble expansion of the universe as photons go through the Hubble expanding universe. Their wavelengths are always redshifting with respect to the co-moving frame. Okay. And we can quantify that. How much shift we get as it moves along because it means something quite interesting. Let's see if I go back to my line here. You know, if I emit a photon at some wavelength here outside the line, if I had a static atmosphere, you know, the photon would just always stay at this wavelength and would never see the opacity of the line. But in a supernova, the photon's going to be Doppler shifting relative to the co-moving frame. That Doppler shift we'll see will be to the red, and so eventually it may actually shift into resonance with the line and feel the effect of the line. And that's actually how lines form in supernova atmospheres. And so we can quantify that shift. It's just a simple Doppler shift formula. If I emit a photon with some co-moving frame wavelength lambda, then as it moves to some other part of the atmosphere, it's going to be Doppler shifted just by our standard Doppler shift formula, right? 1 plus delta V over C, where delta, v, delta V is the velocity difference between the point it started at and the <coughs> point it's gone to, right? Make sense? So, so, and of course we're using a non-relativistic Doppler shift formula here. So let me just rearrange this, move this, uh, move this term over here. V over C, and if I call this the change in change in wavelength, is called it delta lambda co-moving frame. That's just equal to lambda co-moving frame times delta V over C. Where delta V is the change in velocity between the start and stop points. And now if I make the assumption of homologous expansion, this delta V over C can just be replaced by, let's say it moved a distance delta S. Photon moves some distance delta S, then its shift in wavelength is just 
delta s over t c. So just replacing v with delta v with delta s over t. All right, so the, the shift in wavelength as it moves through, again, in the co-moving frame, is always just proportional to the distance traveled, just like a, just like a Hubble expansion. Now you may think this depends upon, you know, here I kind of drew it radially outward. You might think it, it may depend upon the direction the photon's going. If I send a photon in sort of this way, you might think it actually gets blue shifted, say, as it moves along here, instead of getting red shifted as it moves out. But that's actually not the case. No matter what direction the photon's moving, it always red shifts. Uh, a wavelength proportional to the distance it travels. Okay, and that's a, something you can prove if you want to mathematically, but it's, in, it's familiar from Hubble expansion, right? You all know from Hubble expansion of the universe that everything's expanding outward from some point here, but if I go to any other point in the atmosphere and sit there, that point looks like it's the center of expansion. You can prove that for yourself, although it may not be totally obvious. If I go into the frame here, it looks like everything is expanding homologously around here, just like in the Hubble flow. Any, any point in the universe looks like it's the center of expansion. So no matter what direction you're going to, it always looks like you're moving into faster material and you're getting redshifted. All right? And that redshift is always proportional to the distance you travel. And that's actually going to be crucial when we talk about opacity in type 1a supernova and, and kilonova. In fact, what makes kilonova special, um, the fact that photons, as they move through an atmosphere, are always redshifting. So this photon emitted here will redshift until eventually, assuming it starts out close enough, it'll hit this line, maybe move through this line and feel the opacity of this line, and then once it gets past this line, it'll never see this line again, but it may go on to hit some other line here. And so this is really what's going to set sort of the scattering of photons in the atmosphere. Okay? Questions? How much time do I have? I forget what time I'm supposed to stop here. 5.30? Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, so the point here is if I start at some point here, eventually, you know, if I emit a photon here at some wavelength, say over there, it'll, so it'll travel some distance before it comes into resonance with this line. And so there'll be a point in the atmosphere. I can calculate the distance given how far away I am from the line, where the Doppler shifts into resonance with the line, right? So there'll be a point in the atmosphere, a resonance point where the photon feels the opacity of that line. All right? And in fact, it, it won't be just a single point, right? There'll be whole regions where there'll be some length where it kind of comes into feeling the line and it has to move through the line. Uh, and so there's some delta lambda it has to go through to get through the width of the line. And that corresponds to some, some region here where it's in resonance with this line. So you, we would call that a, a resonance region. And how big is this resonance region? So what kind of length scale over the ejected does the lo uh, photon interact with that line? That's kind of the question we want to ask. Well, the answer is here. <laughs> 
that the, you know, the line has a certain width to it, which corresponds to a certain distance that it has to go through, right? So the size of the resonance region Delta L, resonance region, is what? Well, we can just read it off of here. Delta S will be sort of the wavelength region that it has to shift through. So in this case, it has to shift through the thermal intrinsic width of the line. Uh, I'll divide by the wavelength here and multiply by CT, okay? So that's sort of the size of that resonance region, the region where the photon feels the opacity of that line. And I can simplify this a bit. I mean, this ratio here I said before, delta lambda T over lambda naught is basically just the thermal velocity over C, that's what set the width of the line in the first place, times CT. Let me cancel out these Cs and show that the, the width of the resonance region, somewhat intuitively, is just the thermal velocity width times T since we're in homologous expansion, okay? We can compare that to the size of the ejecta. Right. Which is basically the kind of maximum velocity or the typical velocity um, times t, right? And convince ourselves that the size of the resonance region over the size of the ejecta is of order the thermal velocity over sort of the ejecta velocity. is very small. All right. So all this is to say that if we have this condition, which we do in supernova atmosphere and most other transients, where the expansion velocities and the expansion gradients are much, much greater than the uh, thermal velocities, then this resonance region is, is, is really tiny compared to the whole size of the ejecta. It's basically a point. And so line transport in supernova atmospheres behaves very differently than in a static atmosphere. Photon moves sort of freely through space until it hits a point where it's in resonance. Maybe it bounces around here for a bit. Maybe it scatters off into some other direction and moves freely again until maybe it hits another line. And so that's the process here. Contrast that with a static atmosphere where if you emit you know, a photon in the line, it just stays in the line and has to scatter its way through. So this, this is actually quite nice because it makes this line transport problem a totally local one. Whether this photon gets scattered or absorbed by the line really just depends upon the properties of the ejecta in that resonance region. Okay. The, say that again? The, Oh, well, I'm saying for a, for, a, uh, for a static atmosphere, we don't have this Doppler shifting of photons as they move through this kind of Hubble expansion. So if I emit a, if I emit a photon, um, you know, out here, it always stays out here and just escapes. If I emit a photon within the line, it scatters, stays within the line, you know, all the way through the atmosphere. And so I have to calculate how it moves all the way through the atmosphere. And in a supernova, there'll just be one point where it interacts, okay?
And that leads us to what, I guess this is our last assumption. I forget what number I'm at. I think it was five. But this is sort of what underpins uh, a huge number of calculations of supernova spectra and light curves, um, which you may have heard of, which is the Sobolyev approximation, also used in models of winds, uh, uh, other contexts where you have moving atmospheres. And this is really just a narrow, you know, the assumption that the lines are very narrow compared to the expansion velocities. And it, and it means we can, you know, we can assume that the, the ejective properties are constant uh, over, the, over the resonance region. All right. So the optical depth of this line, whether it's strong or not, really just depends upon, say, the density and properties right here. It doesn't depend upon the whole integrated properties along the line of sight. Okay? And so we can use that to basically get what we wanted to, to say, which is to estimate, you know, how strong is a given line? How come I see silicon lines, calcium lines, or so on? In the supernova spectrum, what does that tell me about, say, the composition and density? That is, we can calculate directly the optical depth of a line, what's known as the Sobolyev optical depth. By basically just integrating the opacity of this line over this very small resonance region, right? Basically, the photon's going to shift through the region. It only feels the opacity in this small length scale where it's shifting through this delta lambda, all right? So I can write that down as Sobolyev optical depth. So a typical optical depth uh, you always calculate is a a number density, in this case, I'll be explicit, and I'll talk more about this. It's the number of density of atoms that are in the lower level of the transition I'm interested in. So if we're talking about H alpha, I'm talking about the number of atoms in the n equals 2 state of hydrogen, since H alpha is between the n equals 2 and n equals 3 excitation states of hydrogen. It's the number density times a cross-section, times a length scale. And here the length scale is shifting through this very small resonance region, right? That's just the optical depth, right? It only depends upon the density at this point. Usually you calculate an optical depth, you have to integrate it over some long radial scale. But here, you only feel the opacity locally. So this is just the density that we assume constant over that resonance region. And so we can just calculate this now and get one of the key results in the supernova spectra. Uh, let me just write it out. Number density low, we plug in our cross section that I already gave you, pi e squared over mec. There's the oscillator strength. There's this line profile function, which we'll just take to be a flat top, right? And then there was this factor of lambda not squared over C. That's the standard line cross-section formula that everyone should know. And then I can plug in the length of the resonance region that we just calculated, which was given by the width of the intrinsic width of the line, sigma naught times CT, right? So I know the cross-section, I say the density, but now I know the length scale over which you're interacting with the line, okay? Excuse me? Yeah, I'll... I'll say a little bit more about that, but basically I'm using the, the density here at the region which you come into resonance, 
I should say, you know, where you come into resonance depends upon what the initial wavelength of your photon is. Yeah. So if I emit a bluer photon, it has to go further, say, before it comes into resonance. So this is for some particular photon, it comes into resonance, say, here. There's a density of my ejecta. It's given by whatever model I care about. But this is now, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah and so, but this density here, I'll say in a second, is not just the total density. It's the density in the lower level of the transition. So we'll, we'll have to think about that. You know. It, it doesn't, actually, yeah. So the photon just moves freely through the space. It's not feeling any opacity until it hits the resonance region. And then it has to pass through that resonance region. So the only length that matters is the length of this resonance region. Does it matter? So it's moving like this. As it moves through space, it's also moving through wave things, and it feels no opacity here. And then there's some region. This is when you're in the resonance region where you feel the, opa the opacity, and then you get past it. That makes sense. This is something you see people make errors all the time, especially in other fields and galactic winds or something where they don't take into account the fact that the opacity, you only feel the opacity in this narrow region here where you're in resonance with the line. That makes sense. If your wavelength's away from the line, you don't have any opacity. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it depends where you come into resonance. So, for <coughs> for some photon that comes into resonance here, it just depends on the properties in this resonance region, which is small enough. We said that we can take everything to be constant here. So, temperature density is all constant here. But if I emit another photon, uh, that's you know, in this direction, and maybe it's bluer, maybe it comes into resonance here. And so it'll care about the density here. So basically, we'll see in a second, the Sobolev of optical depth is a local quantity. Every point in space, you'll have a, uh, an optical depth. And say, if a photon happens to come in resonance there, that's the optical depth you'll feel. Okay, so every point in space has, a, has an optical depth. So it's a little different than you're used to. Usually, you think an optical depth is sort of an integrated quantity. But this Sobolev optical depth is a local quantity, a different value at every point in space. And you know, hopefully I'll get to, sh to, to showing you how that plays out. Okay, so let me just simplify this a bit. What's interesting here is that the intrinsic width of the line cancels out. Uh, I can also cancel out one factor of lambda naught and this factor of C. Uh, and get sort of the classic expression for the solely of optical depth. Sorry. And maybe I'll be explicit here. This is a function of you know, where you are in the atmosphere, x, y, and z. There's a different value at every point. Um, because it depends upon the density at some point, x, y, z. Uh, and then we have these factors here. F oscillator. And these all canceled out, and I just get a lambda naught and time. Time since explosion, OK? This is the famous formula for the optical depth, which is a way to say, uh, you know, at, at every point in the atmosphere is a line optically thick. And plug in the values here. Okay. Now let me get to the question of what this value of n low actually is, what, what, what density it is. So, so n low is the density in some lower level of the transition. So if I, for example, look at a hydrogen atom, you know, this is the energy levels of a hydrogen atom. And I care about the H alpha line. 
Well, H alpha is the transition between n equals 2 and n equals 3. So the opacity I care about, n low, is the number density of atoms in this excited level. So some fraction will be in the ground state, but some uh, fraction of the population of total atoms will be in this excited state. Uh, and that's what, uh, what sets our opacity. And so to, to know that, I have to know sort of what's the excitation state of the atom. So I need to know not only the total density of, uh, of ions. So for example, this is, say, the number density of neutral hydrogen atoms. But I also need to know the fraction of those atoms that are in the the excited state that I care about, or maybe I should say the lower level of the transition, how many are in the n equals 2 state. Right? And this is where things could potentially become complicated to try to calculate this excitation state of the, the atom. But it's quite simple if we assume local thermodynamic equilibrium, that is, the level populations obey some sort of Maxwell Boltzmann statistics, right? And this is typically what's done in a lot of codes. A fair approximation, say, for the regions near the photosphere in the early phases where things are um, reasonably thermalized, uh, then you may know that the fractions of atoms uh, in, say, the lower state is just proportional to a Boltzmann factor. So if there's a statistical weight here of the level and a minus e to the delta e kt. Where, where this is sort of the excitation energy here. For H alpha, this is 10.2 EV or so. Yeah, so this is the total number density of hydrogen ions. So in this case, if we're talking about H alpha, this will be neutral hydrogen. So you also have to take into account the ionization state. Uh, I could make that explicit. So this could be uh, the total number density of hydrogen, let's say specifically, times the fraction that is in the state of neutral hydrogen times the fraction that's in the n equals 2 state of hydrogen. And so here, I guess I won't have time to go into this, but here you can calculate this using, say, a Saha, Boltz, a Saha equation or something or some other. Density of what? Neutrals. Neutrals, yeah. Sorry, I, yeah, I shouldn't have said ion. Well, whatever ion you care about. If you cared about silicon, too, it would be that ion. But yeah, that was, that was unclear. It's the number density of whatever, whatever species you're interested in. Okay. And so this will be this. Of course, there's a normalization factor here. It's just the partition function where we sum up over all the other levels in the atom. Okay. But what we'll get at the end of the day is that the Sobolev of optical depth, which basically defines if the line's optically thick or not, if this is greater than one, then the photon's likely to scatter, get absorbed in this interaction. If it's less than one, the photon probably goes right through. If I plug it in, I can get this sort of important proportionalities, okay? So it's going to depend upon the statistical weight of that level, right? It's going to depend upon the oscillator strings. Uh, it'll depend upon this 
Boltzmann factor, which describes how populated this excited level is. Right? So the higher excitation you have, the harder it is to populate that level. Some basic statistical mechanics. Uh, and then if we care, we also have the and the not. So this is a, a good way of estimating the relative strength. Which, which lines are going to be the strong lines? Well, it depends on the oscillator strength or this combination really of G times F, sometimes lumped together. And it also depends upon how excited the level is. So if you have a level that's very high above the ground state, large delta E, it's going to be suppressed a lot by this Boltzmann factor. You're just not populating this level. Okay. And so if you care, you can uh, uh, populate these things. I don't know if I can get the screen to come down or not, or if I have time to populate it. But basically, if you care, all this information is available to you. I have a, put stuff on GitHub. I'll give you a, a link to it. Um, for various things that might be of interest. For example, there's big lists of lines that you care about or may not care about, depending on your uh, personality, that will give you, for all the lines that we know about, their wavelength, this combination of their statistical weight and their uh, oscillator strength, and how excited they are above ground. So, you know, ground state transitions that have zero for their excitation energies are generally going to be the strongest lines. Here it's telling you the atomic weight. And so you can, if you're ever needing lines, there's about 250,000 of them there uh, for you to peruse. If you want to, uh, uh, you know, try to get some sense of what lines are important for a particular supernova spectrum, you can look at this little code that I made available which basically allows you to plot up a supernova spectrum here uh, and it'll tell you which lines are important. So for example, if I want to look at, this is a type 1a supernova spectrum. We kind of said, oh, let's say we didn't know anything about what we're seeing here. Well, we can overplot the lines here. Let's add in silicon uh, 2, singly ionized silicon. Oops. Uh, let me try this again. And it'll plot up first the strongest line of silicon 2, which you see here corresponds well to this absorption feature. Here we've Doppler shift this line by 10,000 kilometers per second. If you want to shift around the velocity, uh, you can certainly do so and see what velocity Doppler shift corresponds to. Uh, and if I have time, I'll tell you a little bit about why it corresponds to the minimum corresponds to there. Do you care about that line? Well, that line is this line in particular. The line at 6347 has this GF and this excitation energy, right? We can add in more lines. So the second strongest line is actually one that's quite close to that. This is actually a doublet transition. So there's actually two lines. The silicon line. The second a little weaker because it has a smaller oscillator strength. And we can add more. Okay, so there's an absorption from silicon here. If we looked at it here, this is also a feature of the famous calcium H and K, but it's not just calcium contributing here. There's also silicon absorption. And you can add in more and see, okay, that absorption is clearly silicon. That little notch is silicon. It's actually a doublet. There's another doublet there and so on and so forth. We can list what the lines are. So this is somewhat of a trivial exercise because we know type 1a supernova fairly well, although you may not know all these. But if you have another supernova spectrum where you want to identify the lines, you can do so. And this tau here is basically the formula I just wrote down. It's the Sobolev optical depth. Um, well, it's how it scales depending upon gf, the e to the minus delta ekt. Uh, and so on. And so this has line data for all lines of supernova that could be useful to have. Okay?
So if you like, I can point you to this code to play around with. Yeah, so all of these have now been Doppler shifted by, by 10,000 kilometers per second, and you can see that that gives a pretty good match. So I'm pretty confident that this supernova spectrum has silicon that corresponds to all these lines. If I, I can shift these all, you know, in a, in a similar way and measure velocities that way, okay? Just a simple tool. So if I have time, I can go through a little bit more. I don't know how much time I have left. Do I have any time left? What's that? I'm almost done. <laughs> done. Okay. Well, as I, maybe as I start next time, I'll, I'll go through a little bit more uh, how you can actually use this to calculate a spectrum and understand in a little more detail uh, this p signy line profile. And if you like, write your own little code to calculate um, spectra uh, for either an individual line or using those line lists, building up a whole spectrum that allows you to basically model spectral profiles, interpret what their kinematics are and what their geometry and distribution is. Uh, and then we'll see all this coming back when we talk about uh, kilonova, uh, all this physics of the radiation transport and the Sobolev optical depth goes directly into our understanding of what the opacity of kilonova is and how we can calculate it uh, and determine that it's significantly different than other um, supernova. So we'll come to that uh, next time. Thank you. Yeah, so that's what I was about to get to, the fact that uh, um, you know, I talked about the uh, you know, photon sort of moving and coming into resonance with a line at a certain point. It interacts, since the line width is very narrow intrinsically, it interacts with a point. But other photons will interact with resonance regions uh, at different regions that are moving at higher velocities. So the width of the line will be associated with the fact that uh, you have opacity at all different uh, wavelengths and all different velocities. Okay, and we'll be able to map basically, I mean, maybe just as a teaser for what I did before. Um, you know, basically, if an observer is here looking at radiation flying out in this direction, basically the absorption here for this thing will correspond to some bulk velocity moving at, you know, 10,000 kilometers per second which will give us an absorption at 10,000 kilometers per second, okay? And so, yeah, I didn't quite get to that, but we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Um, but basically, the, the, the shape of the line is telling us how absorption happens over this entire atmosphere. Jonathan. Yeah. What about these assumptions? Is inherently 1A? Really, nothing is uh, inherently 1A. Uh, this is general to any supernova, so you can apply it to any supernova, really any kind of transient uh, where homologous expansion holds. Um, and you can even generalize it um, to cases where you have non-homologous expansion. So it's a, uh, well, it's, yeah, it's more general than type 1A supernova. Yeah, so the problem gets a lot trickier here. I, I have, you know, I talked about these levels of hydrogen, and I wanted to know how many atoms were in this excited state, since that's where the H alpha transition was. Or for any line, I might care about a different excited state. And so LTE makes it all very simple, because I can basically calculate this using statistical mechanics. It just depends upon the temperature and this energy. But if I don't have LTE, and LTE will break down, in a sense, whenever I don't have, you know, a thermalized, say, radiation field that's driving things to LTE. So if I'm not, uh, you know, if I'm very far from black body, then I need to calculate these level populations in more detail. So what's really going on here is that there's transitions between all these levels. So an electron here can de-excite here, 
course, a photon can come along and excite this back up, or excite up to here and de-excite here. So you have all these transitions back and forth. And of course, in LTE, these all balance out to give you that Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. But when that doesn't hold, you actually have to write down what all these rates are, set up a big matrix that describes all these rate equations, and, and solve it to see what those level populations are. Okay. So it becomes significantly more complicated because I actually have to know all the details of how fast this transition up is and how fast this transition down is. <laughs>